Great. So I want to welcome everyone to. Uh, I'm not Sumner LaCroix. I'm John Brown from Clark University. Uh, I hope I will do as well as Sumner would have in the event that he were here. Uh, we're at session number 13 institutions and Chinese development. And we have three really exciting papers here at our session this morning. I would like to invite first is uh, Xin Nung from University of Texas, Austin, who will be discussing informal succession institutions and autocratic survival. Shen, I think you have your. Yeah. Like four paper presenters, I will be holding up the slides. So, just that night before we have five, two, one, Shen. Since this is a new laptop, so I need to upload my file again. Where's the file? Okay, can I take off my mask? Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Shin from UT Austin, Department of Government. Today, I'm very honored and happy to present my paper, Informal Succession Institutions on an Autocratic Survival, Evidence from Ancient China, which is also part of my dissertation. We all know that institutions are crucial to political stability, especially in authoritarian regimes. And scholars have established that formal institutions such as parties, legislatures, elections, and constitutions contribute greatly to authoritarian continu continuity. However, we still don't know much about whether informal institutions can also deliver political stability to authoritarian regimes. And we will miss many important drivers of political behavior if we fail to consider informal in institutions. In this paper, I focus on informal succession institutions because a succession problem is a very salient issue in authoritarian regimes. In the absence of democracy, arranging a peaceful power transition is very difficult. If the autocrat, uh, so the autocrat faces a dilemma whether to appoint a successor or not. If she appoints a successor, the heir may develop incentives to overthrow the ruler and take power. And if she does not appoint a successor, the elite cannot be promised to continue to receive private goods after the ruler's demise. So I argue that the norm of primogeniture, the right of succession goes to the firstborn child, offers a solution to this dilemma. From a rationalist perspective, it offers a clear expectation about whom will succeed the throne, which increases the likelihood of agreeing on a, on a successor. So basically, the elite, the elite can better coordinate among themselves. It also provides the elite assurance that the regime will reward their loyalty. And also, sons are often younger than the brothers, thus they can better wait to inherit the throne peacefully. Current studies are uh, exclusively focused on a uh, rationalist perspective, and they uh, can ignore uh, accounts from a constructivist perspective. I argue that the norm of primogeniture has normative factors that can constrain and shape the behavior and interest of the autocrats and the elite, and deviations from this norm will face punishment. So I test the hypothesis using data from ancient China for several reasons. First, it complements current studies, which heavily relies on the experience of European states. Second, there was considerable variation in the succession norm in this period. And there were few confounders. Power struggle among the church, kings, and parliaments were absent in this period of ancient China. 
So uh, for the findings, I asked them to count models using individual level data of monarchs. And I find that when the normal primogeniture became stronger, it contributes to about 50% to 57% reduction in the hazard of being deposed, set with pelvis. And I further show that a similar pattern persists in today's autocracies. So this paper speaks to the literature on the effectiveness of informal institutions, and it suggests that rational choice theory and constructivism, they can work together, and we cannot ignore the normative values of informal institutions. It also fits into a growing literature in political science that challenges a Eurocentric approach to world history. So here's a roadmap for the rest of my presentation. I'll first talk about histor historical background of ancient China, and then move to the evolution of succession norms and data and methodology, and then findings and robust and checks, and then we'll talk about external validity. So uh, here's the, uh, some background of ancient China. The period, the period of Mavsari are the spring and autumn period and warring states period, which belongs to the Eastern Zhou period. And in order to understand the Eastern Zhou period, we need to talk about the Western Zhou period. So when the Western Zhou, so the political and economic system of Western Zhou is similar to that of the medieval Europe's feudalism. When the Zhou, and when the Western Zhou overthrew the Shang Dynasty, its founders faced a problem, how to gather the vast territory of land. And, and eventually the founder decided to keep the capital and its surrounding areas and then donated lands to basically his relatives who serve as vassals. And those vassals practice hereditary succession within the territory. They can collect their own taxes and build their own army, but they need to pay tribute to the king of Zhou and provide manpower when needed. However, the decentralized system began to disintegrate gradually in the late Western Zhou period. And during the spring autumn period, the feudal system was gradually transformed into an international system. Hui provides a good summary of this period. Similar to the early modern European states system, the ancient Chinese system experienced pre prevalence of war, disintegration of feudalism, formation of international anarchy, emergence of territorial sovereignty, and configuration of the balance of power. There are basically three types of succession norms in ancient China, horizontal succession, vertical succession, and selection. Under agnatic seniority, the eldest brother succeeds the throne. And under ultimogeniture, the youngest son inherits the throne. And under primogeniture, it's the eldest son. And under selection, the king basically picks who, whoever he likes most. So it is uh, one challenge of studying norms and informal institutions is that uh, it is difficult to understand how the norm emerge and how they change over time. So uh, before the Western Zhou dynasty, phonetic seniority was the dominant norm governing royal succession. And uh, the norm of primogeniture originated from lineage law, a kind of Zongfa system set up by the Duke one of Zhou, who was one of the founders of the Eastern Zhou dynasty. And it was not until the end of the spring and autumn period that primogeniture became the dominant social norm that governed royal succession. And there are several explanations for these evolutional norms. First is marriage customs. Fathers were not certain whether his children share his own blood due to a high degree of sexual freedom before the late spring autumn period. Uh, there are some archaeological evidence and other things I'll talk about in the paper. And the second reason is economic development. Uh, and the third is state capacity. As bureaucratization level increased, states became less dependent on superman leaders. So basically, we don't need to pick the smartest guy to inherit the throne. And we can also conceptualize these evolutional norms as an equilibrium derived from repeated interactions from monarchs and the elite. I developed two measures for the norms of primogeniture over time. Uh, uh, first is the measure, first the measure draws on variations of succession norms over time. And the second measure adds a layer of cross-country variations to the first measure. The state of Song was a descendant of the Shang Dynasty, and the state of Lu was a descendant of the Zhou Dynasty. And the Shang and Zhou Dynasty had a special system called uh, Yi Ji Yi Ji, uh, in which uh, brothers and sons inhabited the throne in, in interchangeably in, in turn. And the state of Song and Lu inherited this special norm. So uh, we can see that the data provides some support for my measurement. As the norm of primogeniture became stronger, the percentage of monarchs succeeded by the sons also increased. 
uh, these numbers are actually slightly higher than that in medieval Europe. So for data collection, I primarily rely on two sources, the Zhou commentary of the spring autumn annals and the records of the grand historian. And when there's a counter between these two sources, which is rare, I cross-reference other sources. And I include classical text for each case of abnormal exit of the monarchs in my cohort. Uh, even so, there are some limitations of the data. Birth order among the children is missing for most entry. And most monarchs do not have a birth certificate. And uh, 10 monarchs appear twice in the data, and the number of sons is likely underreported. So we can see that the monarchs exit the office in many different ways. And the largest category is uh, natural deaths. And the second largest category is coup. And the third is uh, removed by foreign forces. So I asked them to the proportion has the models with share frailty. And failure here is defined by, uh, as overthrown by coup or civil war. And the average time in power for monarchs is 18 years. And the key explanatory variable is normal, the strength of the normal primogeniture and a control for variables, including relationship to the predecessor, predecessor's time in power, exit more of predecessor, external threats, which is measured as the number of times a state was attacked by other states uh, in each century, and also state capacity. So uh, I use two different measures for state capacity. First is the, is the number of newly created counties for each state in the spring and autumn period and warring states period, respectively. And the second is the number of official titles in the state before and after its bureaucratic reform. The correlation between these two measures of state capacity is point six six, which provides some confidence uh, for my measurement. Here's uh, the summary stats, and here are the checks for the model assumptions, which is good. And here are the results. So we can see that the coefficient of primogeniture are negative and significant across all models. Um, which, which suggests that leaders in a country that practice a strong norm of primogeniture are less likely to be removed by domestic elite. It's a bit surprised to me that the exit mode of predecessor is not significant. And it's even a bigger surprise to me that uh, two measures of state capacity, number of counties and number of titles are not significant as well. And uh, right now I interpret it as like, there's still mm, many noises in, in, in my measurement. But uh, another paper, I mean, and who studied like uh, medieval Europe, they also found no significance for the measure of state capacity. So I can now set the robust checks. I include century fixed effects strat or stratified by states or exclude monarchs who enter as the office in a short period of time. And the results remain consistent. So in terms of the mechanisms, it's difficult to test the mechanism using large N analysis because of data availability. So I try to provide some suggestive or anecdotal evidence I mean, for the mechanism uh, of the normative values using the case of Liu Bang, who was the founder and first emperor of the Han Dynasty. So when Liu Bang expressed his intention to replace the prince with the son of his concubine, he faced strong opposition from the elite. And remember, Liu Bang was super powerful. And Zhang Liang, a powerful statesman, strongly opposed this decision and eventually resigned when persuasion failed. And uh, another statesman, uh, Xu Zhengtong, delivered an emotional speech. He walked directly into the palace and said his words, do Shen of Jin replace his rightful heir with the son of his concubine because he loved his concubine, which turned his country into turmoil for tens of years. And he himself became a laughter. If your highness must replace the rightful heir with the son of the concubine, I will cap my throat and shut my blood in the palace. So we can hardly categorize this behavior as like a rational behavior of, of strategic calculations. You can't walk into your boss office and say, if you don't change your mind, I will kill myself. Right? It is not rational. And Liu Bang eventually compromised and, and, and still um, keep the prince as the right way. So for external validity, uh, I, so for external validity, I uh, collect data on all the rulers in modern autocracies. In political science, we categorize uh, autocracy into four types, personal, personal regime, party regime, military regime, and monarchy. And then I, I collect data on the, some practice of primogeniture using, uh, using this information. So here's what we find. The baseline here is the ruler's fate in a party regime. So party regime was considered to be the most stable 
regime type among authoritarian regimes. And we can see that primogeniture even performs better than party regimes. Uh, and these results are mostly driven by uh, monarchies that practice primogeniture. I mean, this is an, only a, some correlational relationship. It's not, it's not even like, I mean, association, but it provides some confidence that, I mean, the, uh, the case I mean, from ancient China is not limited to its own period. So here are some major takeaways. Uh, the norm of primogeniture promotes autocratic survival in ancient China. Informal institutions are important and powerful, and we cannot ignore the normative elements of informal institutions. Thank you very much. Okay, we actually then have a comment on the paper by Melanie Shu of the London School of Econ. Melanie, I think you're here. Great, great. Thank you, Melanie. Um, can you all hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so it is a pleasure to be a discussion of this really nice paper by um, Xin Nong. And I will first summarize the paper just very quickly. Um, I don't think it's super necessary because you did an amazing job of presenting this paper. Uh, so basically the paper talks about the effects of the norm of prime adrenature on um, political stability. And especially it emphasized the importance of the informal succession rules. So this is very important and emphasized repeatedly in the paper. And then it uses the setting of 17 states in ancient China during the spring, autumn, and warring states eras. The main argument is that the norm of primogeniture promotes political stability and incentivizes um, state building. And the paper trying to, when illustrating the, the benefits of, um, of this primate journey, it uses both the rationalist and the constructivist explanations and the showed anecdotal evidence consistent with both. And the paper is very clearly written and it was a pleasure to read. So I will, uh, so this is just a graph. Uh, I think the figure one illustrates all these different succession rules uh, you observe in uh, various parts of the world, including China. So primogeniture is over here, uh, the right uh, bottom corner. And you can see it's a type of the vertical succession rules. Um, it's different from the horizontal succession rules, which usually is the eldest uh, member of the second eldest member of the cohort, whereas the the other rules would involve like the youngest sons or selection rules will be just dependent on uh, what the, whatever the, the current leader prefers. So my main comments, so first, um, so there are several me measures used in the paper. So mostly it's um, using the variation between the spring and autumn periods and the Warren states period, which you know, it assumes from my perspective that it was weaker in the, in the spring and autumn period and then became uh, strengthened during the Warren States period. And there's also additional variation at the cross country level, which goes into the primogeniture measure too. And so my question here is based on what's in the paper, a lot of this is all about the legal wife rather than the actual eldest son. So I wonder if you, you uh, just consider them as that um, would be correlated or is there some other reason you have this interpretation? Because there is no real, uh, it is not necessarily true that the, the son of the legal wife would have to be the eldest. So I think you often have the case that the emperor already had a son or is some who come by, um, come to by, sorry. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then, and then, so by the time that the legal wife had the son, it was uh, not the eldest. And then secondly, I mean, I think the union of analysis uh, you have is, is at the state uh, monarch level. But then I, uh, what, my question is what happens when the state disappears? Because you, re, you look at this period, you mentioned there's like a hundred different states in the, um, the spring and autumn period especially. So without knowing this, I think it's a bit confusing because I don't know what, what, how would you how would you interpret this? Because if what if the states that had this rule do, did have a longer mon duration of each monarchy, but it ends up having a 
uh, disappeared sooner than other states. So would that be actually goes against your results about political stability? And then certainly about the outcome, um, the failure in the paper right now is defined in a pretty narrow way. Um, it's even removed from the office by the groups of the civil war. But there could be other types of failure. Um, some of those are more subtle than others, such as if the, the ruler became too weak, then would it be like seeking help from foreign nations. I think there are some, a few of those are classic examples during this period, but those also be considered as a, as a, a type of failure or not. I guess it's a question about the detailed coding. And then um, going into a bit more details and related to the specifications. So I guess my first question is how do you handle the standard errors, because obviously there's going to be a lot of zero correlation um, in this panel. Um, and then also in the question about bad controls, I mean, as, as, you, as you mentioned yourself, some of those controls don't have the expected signs. To me, some of those controls probably shouldn't be included in the first place, because they are probably an outcome of those primogeniture prim system and themselves, then if control for them, I, I think you can possibly buy for a confessions even. So it's something to think about. And then in terms of confounders, um, so this is partly I, I read from your introduction um, the advantage of the settings, such as that you have this ethnic factor being constant. Uh, but I'm not sure because this is the view from contemporary China, but even that is not 100% accurate. Whereas you go back to the, the past time, um, I mean, I don't think you can consider those countries or states as having the same ethnic identity. They were, I think it would be more appropriate to think of them as different ethnic groups. And therefore, maybe it will even be a useful control to add here. And then there's also obvious question about the confounders. I think you, you go a, a, a long way to trying to deal with this, given the data limitations. But still, I think obvious questions such as the legal wife point, um, the fact that they really endorse the role of uh, the legal wife or the legitimacy comes with it, it could just be reflects the strengths of the elites already. Because obviously, if a legal wife is more, much more likely to come from a decent background compared to some of the other uh, more modest um, wives or the, the concubines, uh, which which you know, in the later later in imperial China periods, and you actually see this as being becoming much more acceptable. I think Ottoman Empire as well. There are prominent empresses that come from a, a no-name background, and then uh, with the fact that no no one had really opposed it, it could just mean the state of the elites by that point is already much more uh, weakened. So, and then in terms of mechanisms, so there's one thing about so this libraries among the heirs. I think um, I wonder if there's some ways you can account for that because there's obviously there's a lot of infighting about this among those heirs, and sometimes it led to deadly consequences. So that would just directly reduce the number of competitors, and then it would not be surprising that you observe uh, more political stability as a consequence of primogeniture. And then there's also to some extensions thinking about you know, the paper doesn't really mention disadvantages of primogeniture. I'm sure there are some. Um, otherwise, all the, I, mean, I guess there would be less variation <laughs> across the states and over time. And is that because you know, there was a, a degree of flexibility or if the eldest son is incompetent? And then also in terms of the effects of this, um, uh, this you know, informal rule versus formal rule, because the, the paper really emphasizes informal rules are, or no, no it's, it's like one thing that distinguishes this paper from literature. But I wonder how did they operate in a different way? Um, is this just informal rules or being seen as like a weaker version of the formal rules? How did this affect the coordination and the, the commitment mechanisms you mentioned in the paper? Uh, is this informal succession rules works just as well, or it might even have some positive benefits? And then lastly, your results about the, the primogeniture uh, from the modern corporacies. Um, that part I didn't quite understand because the paper is supposed to be about informal succession rules. But I think the data set you have probably also include the formal succession rules, the formal primogeniture. So is there some way to distinguish the, between these two types of primogeniture uh, in your analysis of the modern autocracies? 
Uh, so I would just have offered a few very broad suggestions to conclude. So I think it would be good to state the contribution more clearly. Uh, right now, I think you described this as the first empirical evidence that the norm of a prime generature delivers stability to monarchies using novel uh, historical data set of um, ancient China. Uh, and, and not, I think it's a bit uh, ambiguous what you mean here. I think what you mean is that you probably offer the first empirical evidence uh, um, in terms in the, in the context of China, uh, or you mean this is like the first evidence on um, um, this question, and it's just you happen to be using the this data. Uh, because obviously, this previous work you cite in the very first page in the paper is talking about a very related issue. Um, so I think it would be good to make it more clear. Um, and then you have quite a lot of history in that already, but this is a very uh, interesting period. So I think it will help you to give some of this more uh, anecdotes and more accurate, uh, paint a more vivid picture of this period. And also it will be useful to, to explain some of the concept you brought up, which as you mentioned, this is a time almost is, uh, is a period of anarchy. But I think for those who are not familiar with this time, it's, uh, we just don't know at all why this will be a period of anarchy. So things like this. So if you can uh, also give some ex uh, explanations along the way, I think it, will be, it would be very nice. Also in terms of the historical background to this period, I think it's worth mentioning that it was actually the lineage law that destroyed uh, the, the royal authority of, um, of the Zhou court, um, which actually begs the question of how did this independent states that emerged afterwards still endorse this lineage, law, uh, lineage laws. And the, so I think that's pretty much it. So it would be good to also compare it with maybe Rome, Roman Roman Empire, which is about around the same time um, in terms of uh, being uh, ancient, right? It's just as ancient as the the, the the spring and autumn periods, and also uh, implications of political stability and authoritarian regimes. I mean, you're a political scientist, you probably know a lot more than I do on this topic. And I think it's just also something to think about, and like how did that, how exactly this leads into the, the 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 persistence of this autocracy, and does that overall uh, is like a, a good thing or not? All right, so that's all I have. Uh, thank you for again for the uh, very very interesting, very nice paper. Thank you, Melanie, for a very uh, helpful comments. And um, I think just in terms of uh, the complications associated with this process, uh, I'd like to move forward with the other papers, but I do ask those who are in the audience and also on our Zoom uh, virtual uh, world, you could keep take a note of the questions you may have of either the paper or uh, of the paper. Please keep them in mind. We'll take them up at the, at the conclusion of the formal presentations. Thank you, Shift. Our next uh, presentation is by Tuan Hui Singh of the University of Singapore and uh, co-authors and uh, on aristocrats and bureaucrats. So Tuan Hui, we invite you to commence your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so uh, this is a very new uh, project that I'm working uh, with Jia Hua Che from China Europe International Business School and uh, John Hua from Johns Hopkins uh, University and I'm Chuan Hui So uh, in this paper, we like to think about the transition from patrimonial aristocracy to meritocratic uh, bureaucracy. We know that like historically, uh, many great thinkers have actually taught, uh, have actually spoke very positively about meritocratic selection in public administration, even though the word meritocracy is it's re relatively uh, new, uh, just appeared a few decades ago. So uh, Plato, Confucius, Mozart, Manchus, uh, and so on and so forth, they all talk about uh, the, the benefits of meritocratic selection. Max Weber, uh, spoke about the bureaucracy, meritocratic bureaucracy as the ideal, uh, sorry, the, uh, the bureaucracy as the ideal type of formal organization. And Francis Fukuyama in uh, his two books, uh, recent two books talk about the success of the West uh, lying in its ability to weaken patrimonialism. So here I have a quote that comes from the first in, uh, installment of the two books, the struggle to replace tribal politics with a more impersonal form of political uh, relationships continues in the 21st century. So 
historical progress, uh, it's really about, uh, according to him, uh, or largely about weakening patrimonialism in, 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 in political institutions. So uh, in this paper, we uh, like to think about this, uh, a, few a few related questions. So first, why the human propensity to create and recreate patrimonial political institutions? So the benefits of selection by ability, I think they are obvious, uh, but are there any practical benefits for a regime to maintain a privileged class? Uh, a related question, why did all societies start off with patrimonial institutions? Why don't we see the reverse? So for example, or like flip-flopping, but then uh, that why can't we start with bureau meritocratic bureaucracy first? Uh, why do we always start with patrimonialism? And how did patrimonial institutions weaken over time? Uh, the third related question, it's to think about instead of a temporal change, uh, to think about the spatial dimensions. How did patrimonial institutions influence the spatial organization of uh, pre-modern empires? And then finally, uh, we tend to assume that bureaucratization and political centralization uh, goes hand in hand. Uh, Max Weber talks about it, uh, but why is it so? So we like to think about these questions. And uh, in terms of historical evidence, uh, if I have time, I would largely draw from uh, the experience of China uh, because of its long history of bureaucratization. Okay, so uh, let's go into some definitions first. So in this paper, it's a theoretical paper, so we will have a theoretical model. Uh, in the model, the regime can think about like uh, things about hiring administrators. It can pick two kinds of administrators. The first, right, would be an individual who receives hereditary benefits from the regime. And because this individual enjoys tenure, he has a stake in the regime. Uh, so for that reason, he's going to have uh, some loyalty to, to uh, the regime, not absolute loyalty, but some loyalty. Uh, but because uh, he's selected by hereditary principle, so uh, we are assuming that he's of average ability. Uh, and we call this person, uh, this individual, a patrimonial aristocrat. So when I talk about aristocrat, we meant a patrimonial aristocrat. I'll talk about the other kinds of aristocrats uh, soon. The second type of individual that the regime can hire is an individual recruited based on uh, merit. So because he receives uh, transient benefits or at least like uh, shorter term benefits compared to the uh, patrimonial aristocrat. So by, uh, by comparison, he would have uh, lower loyalty. Uh, but because he's selected based on merit, he's more competent, we call this individual a bureaucrat. So you may think that historically there are many aristocrats who are actually not in some sense like related to uh, the ruler. He's not beholden to the ruler. For example, autonomous uh, landed elites who compete with the ruler for powers. So our model, our paper does not directly address this uh, this kinds of administrators whom the ruler appoints just because he can't remove this, uh, these people away. But if we have time, uh, maybe during the Q&A, uh, I can talk about how we can think about our, like, uh, think about this kind of, of, of administrators uh, from the perspective of our model. So, uh, I won't have time to go into the building blocks or uh, the details of our model. So, uh, but, but the main argument would be represented in this slide. So this is really like the essence of our argument. So we argue that there's a fundamental tension between creating loyalty and attracting talent from the perspective of the power holder. So if you think about a meritocratic system, every bureaucrat who is hired under like meritocracy knows that he, I, I use he because historically most of them are he, uh, he will be replaced at some fixed interval. So because these people will be replaced because it's a meritocratic system, you can't give like these people long-term incentive. For that reason, they will have low, lower uh, loyalty. And because of that, you can't give them too much discretion and you can't uh, delegate too much power to them because they, they are not... Uh, Loyal. So because of all these uh, arguments before, bureaucratic rule is feasible only if political centralization is, is feasible. So when and where centralization is costly, you will tend to see that the ruler would prefer to appoint patrimonial uh, administrators like uh, his friends, his sons, his kins, uh, people from his, his larger uh, family network. Uh, so let me talk about when first. So when technology, 
is relatively backward when social economic factors hinders uh, the selection of, of, of uh, by merit, then uh, we are going to see uh, more aristocratic rule. So uh, I identify three uh, conditions here. So if you have poor communication, transport, logistics, uh, so that you can't transfer resources for the sake of political centralization. When you have low organizational capacity, because if you think about centralization, uh, you really need a system to monitor and reward the administrators. So you have a hierarchy and that hierarchy has to function uh, relatively efficiently uh, for you to monitor and reward. So for these reasons, uh, if you have low organizational uh, capacity, uh, it's, it's, it's hard to implement a bureaucratic system. Uh, and then uh, if you have low education and uh, literacy rates in the general population, if there's no effective technology, for example, like an uh, imperial examination system to identify talents, uh, aristocratic rule will be default. So now let me just talk about where. So if you think instead of temporal, uh, in terms of, uh, in, instead of time, you think about space. Uh, if we think about how an empire should organize itself, then uh, bureaucratic districts should be next to the capital city. And then arist aristocratic fiefs should be like fencing it next. That means that between the bureaucratic district and the border. And the reason again, it's because of political centralization. You want to keep bureaucrats near to you because uh, this is the zone that you centralize power. And that's uh, for technological constraints, organization constraints, and so on and so forth. It's easiest for you to centralize power uh, uh, around the capital city rather than far away from it. So uh, our main the main implication from this argument would be that technological and social economic change would be like uh, major driving forces in uh, driving the transition from aristocracy to bureaucracy. And the other thing would be this, that if we think about patrimonial uh, appointments, patrimonialism, uh, for example, Francis Fukuyama would talk about it uh, as if it is a social ill to be removed. And we agree that this is, this is uh, not a fair system that that uh, people are being appointed just because uh, of, of the family they were born into. But then given technological constraints and given certain social economic uh, conditions, uh, patrimonial appointments may be constrained optimal. Um, and under this con uh, condition, at least from this perspective of political stability, uh, uh, patrimonial appointments are not always inferior to meritocratically appointed uh, individuals. So uh, related literature, there is uh, actually a, a big literature in, uh, that talks about patrimonial political institutions, uh, Weber, um, uh, Francis Fukuyama, I've talked about them, um, Douglas uh, Allen, uh, has a paper in Explorations in Economic History talking about the British uh, English aristocracy. And uh, Yohin Wolf and, and, and uh, Guo Xu, uh, in a recent uh, paper, empirically looks at how patronage can actually be beneficial if uh, leaders use private information to select officials uh, fairly. Our paper is also related to uh, this, this rather uh, diverse uh, literature that either talks about institutional uh, beautification or transaction costs. Uh, Afner, Gra Afner Greif about uh, this personal, like institutions based on personal exchange and also in, uh, in personal exchange. Uh, Douglas Allen's book in 2012 and also uh, Marsha uh, Moff and Neiman's uh, paper about how geography can actually uh, influence the selection of political institutions. And then uh, two other strains of literature that our paper is related to, loyalty and competence trade-off uh, in political science. And also in recent uh, few years, there are a few papers that discusses about China's early bureaucratization. I think we complement this these papers by focusing a, a different mechanism, but also focusing less on bureaucratization and more on on, on patrimonialism. And I hope like uh, as, as I go through this, it will become clearer. Uh, okay, when so you, have, you, when, uh, you have about five minutes left, just to let you know. Okay, sure. That's so I'm going to skip the, 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 the models, uh, the details of the model, and I just want to go through the main results and then talk about the history very briefly. So 
Improvement in tech, uh, transport and organization technologies will promote centralization and bureaucratization. Same for social leveling uh, and spread of education to the general population, because then uh, you have more people educated, the upper tier of the population will become available for selection as, as bureaucrats. Uh, the third thing would be that if you have a presence of a tight knit uh, elite group, it discourages centralization and bureaucratization. All three uh, results seems like fairly straightforward, but actually uh, I would argue that only the third one is. If you think about one and two, there are actually countervailing forces uh, that are in place. So if you think about technological improvements that favor hiring more bureaucrats, what would happen is that because you have an improvement in technology, the regime survival probability goes up and this would actually make aristocrats more loyal and therefore more useful to the regime. So eventually, even though like uh, solving the model suggests that uh, that, that uh, technological improvement will lead to the regime hiring more bureaucrats, but because uh, the aristocrats are becoming more useful as well. So, so you are not going to see the aristocrat disappearing overnight, that, that all this change will, 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 will be a gradual process rather than like a one-off uh, development. So uh, let me go to the example of China. So in the paper, uh, okay, so even though China was the first bureaucratic state, we argue that like uh, that that I mean like it's a historical fact that China still began with patrimonialism, um, as as the the previous paper has argued. Like if you think about Western Zhou, uh, this was the age of feudal uh, feudalism in China, and indeed. Uh, uh, like if you have like technologies and social economic conditions that are not favorable to to more impersonal uh, selection of more impersonal individuals, this is what you would get. Uh, that the ruler has to rely on his uh, like kinship network to appoint uh, administrators. So uh, the other predictions that we have is that like you should see that the capital city is surrounded by prefectures and districts bureaucratic run and then by thieves if you think about like in his Chinese historical periods uh, you tend to this is for example Han Dynasty you have this area that is uh, run through uh, as prefectures and districts and then you have the, uh, the the vassal kingdoms in the case of the Qing Dynasty which is more recent again you see that the bureaucracy Democratic zone. It's 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 closer to the uh, capital city, and then further away places would be the feudal kingdoms. When if and when feudal kingdoms exist, uh, let me just very quickly just talk about. Uh, so we try to do some comparative discussion as well. Why it is the case that uh, China was the state that you see uh, bureaucratization uh, first, and then relatively durable uh, bureaucratization. We argue that this has to do with recurring political unification in China. It creates a large state when you see uh, a lot uh, when China it tends to be politically unified, and then the outcome is a large state. A large state and a large market gives early technological lead. Uh, so uh, this comes from like if innovation it's 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 uh, driven by learning by doing doing, then you tend to have skill effect a skill effect as predicted by unified growth theory. And then uh, the needs of the empire may also spur uh, transport and organizational in, uh, innovations, which lowers the cost of bureaucratization and lowers the cost of political centralization. And finally, when you have a large territorial state, it's actually easier for aristocrats to fall out of the aristocratic class. And the reason is because if you think about uh, an aristocracy, it is really a social club. Uh, historically, aristocrats organize social events to build bonds. If you have a state that you and fifth your and fifth uh, lot can't interact with the, the other lot and the ruler in the capital city, it tends to lead to lower trust over time. And then the system of, 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 of uh, feudal kingdoms tends to uh, lead to political instability. And for this reason, uh, Chinese rulers are always uh, keen uh, in, in trying to suppress uh, like or try not uh, trying to to reduce like uh, the improvements of, of kingdoms uh, relative to other uh, other countries so uh, like in the paper we discuss about Japan uh, Korea and Vietnam so even if Korea and Vietnam you tend to see service uh, civil service examinations being implemented early but uh, if uh, the, his the historians who work on Korea and Vietnam tends to find that China tends to be a lot more 
uh, oh, sorry, this uh, Viet Korea and Vietnam tends to be a lot more aristocratic than China. So I have a quote here, which I don't have time to go into. Oh. So let me just- oh, great. I'm looking to the conclusion. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Okay, so uh, let me just very uh, quickly conclude. So um, like uh, in this paper, we discuss about, uh, we, we try to offer a theory of uh, patrimonial aristocracy. Uh, we are arguing that patrimonialism is not solely driven by the inner desire to pass resources to the king. Uh, in fact, if an aristocracy did not exist, it would be in, uh, in the interest of the ruler to create it for the purpose of running the state because uh, it can serve uh, useful purposes at a time when social, when technology and social economic conditions are still not ready for meritocratic selection. Uh, just one caveat: uh, we don't ex uh, we don't cover many aspects of uh, the aristocracy. We are just we, we think that like this dimension that we highlight is important uh, to understand. But this is not all the entire story. Uh, that's all for now. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Oh. Our, our discussant uh, is uh, Jared Chapman from Chapman, Jared Rubin, sorry, uh, Chapman University. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, oh, uh, Wenfei, could you actually uh, stop your share, please? Oh, I have stopped my share. Oh, you have? Yeah, this is the, oh, this this is the yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm good. All right, uh, thank you all. I will share my slides here in a second. All right, cool. Thank you, Twanwee, for this presentation. Um, happy Halloween, happy uh, Reformation Day as well, for those of you who celebrate. Um, so this is a paper about the theory of aristocracy and uh, you know, I'm going to get to a lot of things I, I like about it, but you know, Tuanwi's last point there, I think, you know, his the caveat at the end was somewhat telling in that this isn't really a paper about a theory of aristocracy. It's a it's a theory of part something aristocracy does. So just title wise, in the uh, in our uh, program here, it's called aristocracy and bureaucracy. I guess I should take this off. Um, I suggest you, uh, you know, perhaps stick with that. And let's see if we can get this rolling. All right. So just a very quickly, um, in fact, you know, because especially because Tony, we didn't have time to get through all of it. I'll give you kind of the key tension here. And then a few takeaways that I think, you know, this is probably, this is almost solely a theory paper with with uh, some historical narrative. So I will primarily focus you know, on thinking about the theory, what it tells us and uh, where it can be strengthened. Because this is a big paper I mean, in terms of what the authors are intending to do. And this is a big issue. And I think that, um, yeah, Tuan Wee, I have known for a while now, is um, often tries to think big. And I, 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 I love papers like, like this. Um, you know, so that you should take these comments as highly constructive. Um, all right. So the key tension that they look at, that they assume, to be clear, this is, this is an assumption baked into the model that we, we, and we'll need to think about, is that aristocrats have a stake in the system and are thus less likely to cheat when collecting taxes, providing public goods, things like this. Um, bureaucrats, on the other hand, are more capable, you know, in the Chinese context, certainly, I mean, I think that this is a fair assumption, they go, you know, there's examinations that they have to pass. And uh, as they progressively uh, move up the bureaucracy, those examinations uh, be harder, uh, uh, harder to pass. And thus, you know, there, there is a certain level of talent that is that is coming out of this. All right, so this yields predictions, the, this basic tension, you, know, you build a model around it, yields predictions about political centralization, when and really where it's it's actually more where i suppose uh, bu bureaucrats versus aristocrats will be used to uh, be the primary administrators of the state and some other things like um, information <clears throat> excuse me information communication technology the role that that plays in these decisions as well all right so these are very important questions some type of trade off like this is uh, is not just a Chinese thing. You know, this is something clearly, uh, if we think about it, say medieval Europe, this would have, this was certainly the type, you know, something you might think of modeling as a, a ruler's a, a decision a king or queen might've had to make. Certainly this would have been true in the Middle East uh, and for much of Middle Eastern history as well. Um, 
One thing that's very nice about this model, as I think any any good model should do, is it lays out assumptions and it tells you, you know, given these assumptions, what are the outcomes? That's that's how we I think we should model things. Um, but about these assumptions, I mean, when we're thinking about big questions like this, I think a lot of a lot of what a paper like this needs to do is justify assumptions. It needs to justify it historically, and it needs to justify it theoretically. And they, I mean, this is not to say that they, they don't do this, but um, I have questions. Um, all right, so I think first thing, you know, my, my first comment here is, what is the theory of rulership? I think if you're gonna have a theory of aristocracy, you need to think how, the, how the aristocrats, well, first off, who they are, why, the, why do they have sources of power? And why do rulers need them? All right. So this is really about power relationships. I think. I think at least. So why? And I think we're also thinking about a model. What is assumed? Need, on the one hand, needs to be let out, and also what is implicitly assumed. So, for instance, if a ruler can just choose, pick and choose, to use a bureaucrat or an aristocrat to conduct the affairs of the state. There is a fairly strong implicit assumption here, namely that the, the ruler has power vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, the aristocrat. This is a fairly strong assumption, actually. I, I mean, I think certainly if, if you think about it with respect to medieval Europe, what were the sources of power for the for aristocrats in medieval Europe? In part, they had uh, access to coercive power themselves. This was not something where rulers, especially weaker rulers, you know, you think about, you know, certainly like King John or something in England. Um, certain, I mean, most most French rulers, up, you know, in the, in the late medieval period, did not really have court, the, the power to to just replace an aristocrat with a bureaucrat had they wanted to. This is something that needs, I think, needs to be thought about, and really, it's what is the aristocrat source of power. That's something we need to think about because it's 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 going to have implications for the very types of things that the authors are trying to explain. Um, so to the degree that that aristocrats might have some independent source of power, independent of the ruler, independent of the ruler's decision to use them in conducting the affairs of the state, this is something that is going to constrain the ruler. And it's going to be something that may incentivize rulers to to act in certain ways. Um, and I think that this such an assumption is implicit right now, but I think it needs to be made transparent. You know, what is actually being assumed in the relationships the, you know, between the, the various players? All right. So another another quote, and I think this is from the introduction. Because the aristocrat has a stake in the regime, he could be entrusted with some resources to provide public goods locally. The bureaucrat, on the other hand, will squander resources entrusted to him if given the opportunity. So this is they operationalize this with a cost. Um, all right. So is this something that's justifiable? Because this is, again, something that is an assumption because they're essentially assuming that there is an additional cost and this cost of embezzling. You know, in a sense, we, we should think about the cost of embezzling as... Uh, yeah, you're, you don't get future returns because you get kicked out of the aristocratic system. This is an assumption. All right, this is not an outcome. So we need to really justify this. So again, the implicit assumption here is actually you know kind of similar to what I was describing before, is that on the one hand, uh, the ruler really can't punish embezzlement or has a similar capacity to punish elites and commoners. Right, because if the ruler could could punish embezzlement, to go back to the quote, um, especially among what well, I'm calling commoners, we should think about as as bureaucrats. Then it's not it's un, then the bureaucrat is almost certainly not going to squander the resources, right? And I think you know they do have a reason to to make this assumption. This is something yeah, you know, and I think that they the the reason given in the paper at least is you know pure mon uh, or really high monitoring cost, low monitoring technology. Again, though, we have to think about sources of power. Is, is it really, can, the, can a ruler really punish the uh, aristocrat? Where, I mean, in, again, in, in medieval Europe, parts of medieval Europe, the answer is very clearly no. In, in certain parts of, uh, you know, let's say Ottoman history, 
yeah, the you know, uh, the ruler would have had limited capacity to punish most Timar holders who were administrators like this. So without a theory of power, without a theory of rulership, I think one final thing I'll get to here is it's also kind of difficult to think through internal threats to the regime, where those might come from. So, you know, they, they quote, I think, again, this is in the intro, while the aristocrat is mediocre in aptitude, the fact that he's beholden to the regime makes him a loyal servant. Meanwhile, a bureaucrat selected by the by meritocratic means will be low on loyalty. Now, when we think about where threats to the regime might come from, in many cases, it's from aristocrats themselves. So again, there there is reason to think, and I and I buy the assumption that loyalty, you know, that 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 and that rulers can garner loyalty by by giving rents, by keeping uh, you know the powerful within the system, give them an incentive to stay in the system. But that's not really. You know, the, the, there's a downside to this too, which is why I say, you know, bureaucrats were often rotated in China and the Iron Empire. So we, we, you know, I think this is part of the the logic here that, you know, maybe, maybe it could come out. So let me, uh, I'll do that last slide. Um, I just wanted to say that these might seem critical, but this is really a big project. And I want to make it very clear that in big projects like this, you know, there's just a lot to think through. And this is a really exciting project, and I really look forward to seeing it take shape. And I will leave it there. Okay, so let's... Uh, so our our final paper of our session, which I've, I've actually found, I found very uh, stimulating, is by uh, Simon Yarza of the University. Uh, sorry, Beat Beatrice uh, Simon Yarza, University of Navarra. So Beatrice, uh, take it away, please. Thank you. Can you hear? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so thank you very much uh, for being here. And I am Beatriz Simon Yerza from University of Navarre in Spain. And today I will present this working paper, uh, which was also part of my dissertation called The Changing Wheels Hypothesis, Corruption and Development, Evidence from China. And so the starting point of the paper is refers to China's paradox, and which also refers to the fact that China has been able to grow and maintain high levels of growth during the last more or less 40 years, despite experiencing at the same time high levels of corruption. So the reason why we talk about China's paradox is because we tend to assume that corruption and we see corruption as an obstacle to economic development. And this links with an ongoing debate that I would like to spend here a few minutes about this debate and the historiography of the debate, because it helps us to understand our current view on this topic. So this debate on whether corruption weeks or sands the wheels of economic development dates back at least to the 60s when some political scientists, and among them were Leff and Huntington, stated that actually corruption in some countries um, contributed to overcome inefficiencies in those countries and therefore supported the recent uh, Will's view. Yet economists model the problem of corruption years later as the principal agent model. So they provided this characterization of the corruption problem and concluded that actually corruption was an inefficient solution. So some seminal papers that were key in this, um, this debate were those of Becker and Stigler, Murphy and Schleifer and Bisney years later. And these papers actually shaped the way corruption was analyzed later, mainly as a problem, a, a principal agent problem, and also uh, gave rise to the generalized view that corruption sends the wheels of development. However, when we looked at the empirical evidence, uh, it is not so clear which view is the case. So empirically, there are papers supporting both the greasing wheels view as well as the sanding wheels view. And an important paper at the time was that of Meon and Weil in 2010, where they show actually 
that the damaging effect of corruption uh, was milder in countries that experience uh, low levels of institutional quality. So corruption in countries with mm, less institutional quality, the effect of corruption was less damaging. And there's also historical evidence of countries that nowadays experience uh, low levels of corruption or high economic development, but it actually used to experience also high levels of corruption during their economic uh, booming period. And China is nowadays one of, I mean, the latest and current challenges to this uh, generalized Sandy and Will's view on corruption. So the reason why there is such an unconclusive evidence about the role of corruption lies mainly in the lack of the theory linking corruption and development. So this is the aim of the paper to, I mean, here I suggest uh, a framework to analyze the link between corruption and development. And the one that I'd suggest is precisely the institutional framework. So to analyze the impact of corruption on development, I argue we should analyze the impact of corruption a, on the institutional in system where corruption is embedded. And the reasons to have, I mean, to have this institutional framework are mainly two. First, that corruption understood as the abuse of entrusted power for private gain fits into the definition of institutions provided by Douglas North of institutions as humanly devised constraints that shape human interaction or less formally, the rules of a game within a country. So once corruption becomes pervasive, becomes a norm in a country, it can be seen as an informal institution. And also, and well, here I take a position, uh, is that institutions have been proved to be key long-term drivers of development. So uh, what I suggest is analyzing the impact of corruption on the institutional system where it is embedded and then on development. So. I'm going to skip this. So the next question we, well, what does make an institution growth enhancing? And there is a whole literature on this topic and it's beyond the scope of the paper. But actually uh, scholars like Wallis North and Vangest suggested the open access orders or limited versus limited access orders. Also Ogilvy and Caruso talk about generalized versus particularized institutions. And as Moglu, I also talked about extractive and inclusive uh, institutions. So I take a common feature of all these definitions they provide, which I coin under the name of openness, and it refers to the amount of people that a particular institution, or if we talk about institutional systems, institutional systems, uh, the amount of people protected by the institution. So here we would have a spectrum of institutions and at the end, the extremes, which are ideals and in reality never comes purely, of either open institutional systems that provide a broad protection to everybody in a society, especially protection of property rights, whereas closed institutional systems are those, I mean, in the extreme would protect only one person. So to see whether a particular institution within an institutional system contributes to uh, improve the overall system or not, we should look at the relative degree of openness of that institution. And here, this allows us to analyze both the particular institution from the static perspective, as well as from a dynamic perspective. So from the static perspective, one could check the precisely the amount of people that the particular institution protects, the relative openness with respect to the default formal institution within the country. And this also allows us to see a dynamic effect because even that we're talking about openness and protection to a subset of people and a particular institution can either increase protection to more people or concentrate it into an elite, a more reduced group. And this can change the power distribution, the power balance within the country, setting in motion a process of change. So a particular institution may contribute to development if first from a static perspective is more open and to it sets uh, in motion a process of a power diffusion that allows or rather that provides the elite an incentive to change formal institutions. So I um, mean, uh, to see this with an example, we can think of countries under the rule of law that are formal uh, institutional settings that are close to open institutional settings. And in this context, corruption would just emerge uh, 
as an institution that actually is reducing the amount of people protected as it provides protection or access or privileges to the agents that are engaging in corrupt agreements as opposed to everybody that would be protected by the default formal institutional set. So in this case, corruption would act, would act as a closing institution with respect to the default formal institutional set. And this is actually the case of principal agent models, even though they conclude that corruption is inefficient, but they do it precisely because they are assuming that by default, the, I mean, the country, I mean, the default set is one that enjoys formal institutions that actually are open and uh, protect property rights to everybody, of everybody, sorry. But most countries are far from enjoying this rule of law that protect all, all societies' property rights, whereas several countries have formal institutions that tend to protect only an elite or a smaller subgroup. So in this context, corruption, first from a static perspective, may emerge as a particular institution that extends protection to a larger set of people. And it will contribute to development dynamically if uh, it diffuses power among this new group and either they can challenge the, the existing formal institutions or directly provide incentive to the elite to change the institutions in order to make them more open. So here you can see, I mean, I, I circled the open institutions and put a square in the closed institution because this actually captures the, the idea of the changing wheels uh, hypothesis metaphor. So if institutions are the wheels, uh, countries with open institutions have random wheels and are able to, to develop uh, faster. So in that case, corruption may just uh, stop and send, send those rounded wheels, so slow down the pace of development. Whereas in countries where the problem is precisely the formal institutions, we can think about them as countries with square wheels. And corruption, even if sent in this case, in some cases, may contribute to polish uh, the wheels the institutional wills of the country. So in that sense, corruption at some point uh, can emerge as an institution that uh, contributes to the development of a country by changing, by contributing to change the formal system. But of course, in the long term, once the, re the wills have become rounded, of course, it would always sense them. So next, I revisit the case of China, of China's recent uh, economic development. And I rely on also what some scholars have um, shown about the way corruption was performed in China over the last 40 years. And first of all, China during the 80s inherited a quite close formal institution. So they were going out from the Cultural Revolution and the party was the main, uh, the main fundamental institution. It is also still nowadays, but in a different way. And here I would like to make a point, which is the party is an organization with more than 90 million members, but I consider the elite only members belonging to the central apparatus as they are able to change the formal <laughs> sorry, the formal institutional setting of China, whereas local cadres, even though even though they have execution power, um, they cannot change the formal institutions in that way. So I don't consider them as part of the elite. And then uh, corruption at this time was mainly decentralized, like the major form of corruption uh, occurred in the form of agreements between local leaders and local agents. So the analysis of this type of corruption under the changing wills hypothesis is from a static perspective, corruption during the 80s in China actually contributed to uh, increase the protection to private agents I and mean, to local agents, some protection that actually formal institutions denied and they could therefore take up social uh, productive activities that were forbidden otherwise, such as in the case of the household responsibility system or uh, the creating of de facto private enterprises. This was thanks to the agreement between local leaders under corrupt agreements and agents. Oh, so, Beatrice, maybe five minutes, just to let you know. In terms of okay. time. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so from a static perspective, we can say that corruption during the 80s, it was uh, acted as a, an open institution with respect to the formal institutions. Whereas from my perspective and the fact that this form of corruption was decentralized and benefited mostly leaders at the local level, often at the expense of the central apparatus and of the of the elite at the center, 
actually provided an incentive to the elite to change formal institutions to end up with this type of decentralized corruption that actually was diverting wealth at the local level. And it did also um, tie in 2006 and 2007, also uh, talked about the way several formal institutional reforms in China occurred were by adaptation, meaning that actually a reality that was, that was formally banned. In the end, the party changed the formal institution to just adapt to an already existing informal uh, reality. And so this informal reality often came in the form of corrupt agreements. And later, the, the elite has just to adapt the formal institution to end up with that form of corruption and uh, to control the drainage of power. So I will skip this part. In the in the paper, I explained three study cases about the household responsibility system, the red hat strategy and the dual track system that follow precisely this pattern of uh, reform. And in the 90s, we see that in China, there was first a great, what I call a great institutional leap forward. Um, partly due because of the corruption explained previously, but also uh, the Chinese Communist Party wanted China to enter, join uh, international organizations, and they were required because of the failure in 1994 to enter the General Agreement of Trades and Tariffs uh, to assimilate somehow institutionally to Western countries. So you can see that just in six years, China passed 152 laws as compared to the 170 previously passed in more in 43 years. So the, the Chinese, Communist, Chinese Communist Party made a great, great effort to kind of establish something similar to the rule of law. And also corruption experienced a structural, a structural change. So uh, it uh, finished mainly the decentralized corruption and the major form of corruption after the mid nineties was organized corruption. And a key feature of this form of corruption is that it, it was and it is often led by members belonging to high ranks of the party by the elite. So this makes corruption totally different. So from the change in Will's hypothesis perspective, if we analyze the static uh, perspective of corruption, it's unclear whether this form of corruption nowadays contributes to open or not the, the access to several agents because Tetris Paribus, as, as formal institutions improve, any positive of effect of corruption will disappear, will tend to disappear over time. Yet China has not accomplished yet full reform, and there are many cases where formal institutions still are closer and corruption in this sense uh, may contribute to open, to open it. Whereas in some other cases, it's not. And actually, formal institutions have been reformed. And the fact that corruption uh, is still working there, it prevents the formal institution from unleashing its uh, protective, its protection to all individuals. And yet, from the dynamic perspective, it's easier to, I mean, the, the analysis of this form of corruption as the fact that it is now the elite, the one that is benefiting uh, out of this form of corruption, makes I mean makes me predict that this will prevent uh, full reform to be completed because the fact that the elite is now benefiting out of the forms of corruption impedes and prevents the let that China accomplished full reform because in the end it is the elite the one who has to achieve I mean to to fulfill it so I will just finish because I'm running out of time and so the main home takeaway of this paper is providing and suggesting a new framework to analyze the link between corruption and development, which is the institutional framework. And of course, a lot of research is required, uh, both uh, by creating models theoretically and also empirically to test this hypothesis, which is what it is. And so what I came is that we shouldn't ask whether corruption greases or sands the wheels, but instead, how does corruption change them? So thank you very much. And sorry, because I'm one minute. Thank you very much, Beatrice. And uh, Beatrice, if you could uh, stop your share, that'd be great. Uh, yeah. Thank you. And uh, our uh, commentary will be provided by uh, Carol, Carol Shui. So this is uh, the changing wheels hypothesis, corruption and development evidence from China. 
I really appreciated the chance to read this paper and think about the uh, questions that are being raised here. So it's a very interesting paper and it raises large and important questions about institutional change in general and specifically to China. Uh, what it does, it, it traces out examples of what are initially illegal and rule-breaking practices. And it shows that eventually these become acceptable practice. And in fact, the new default Communist Party, Chinese Communist Party endorsed rules. And so um, there's examples in the paper, for example, the household responsibility system that started up as a bottom up innovation. Um, and this put greater pressure on Chinese formal institutions to change. It sort of led the way, like Deng Xiaoping uh, said, you know, they're trying to cross the river by feeling out the stones. And this is small changes that eventually get adopted and are transplanted elsewhere. So really good example of how institutional innovations lead to spillovers and dynamic, uh, dynamic process of change. And so corruption is not such a bad thing in this example, um, because um, you know, you know, in disentangling the paradox, which is that China has seen a period of high growth rates despite apparent high corruption, it is really less of a paradox than it initially seems for the reason that there's so many ways to uh, interpret corruption. It could be outright theft, but it can also refer to access money. It can refer to ways that people use to um, speed up uh, red tape or get through red tape. And so especially in a, an environment in which the economy is planned, uh, this kind of so-called corruption can actually result in better solutions, more efficient solutions. And um, there's a paper by, by Xian Song in, uh, it's called Special Deals and Chinese Characteristics, Special Deals with Chinese Characteristics. And what they, uh, they argue is that Chinese local governments had enormous power to provide special deals for private firms. And so China's extraordinary economic growth comes about thanks to these special deals. And um, and how that is leading is is the topic of this paper. You know, how does it affect uh, other institutions? So there's many metaphors in the paper. It's a uh, at this point, it's a it's a descriptive um, it's a descriptive paper. And uh, and and in this literature, what I learned was that there's many metaphors for corruption and for institutions. And so the questions that I think would be useful uh, going forward is just to, to lay out more carefully what corruption is from whose point of view among all of these um, agents that are in the economy, whether it's the Xi Jinping at the top or as it filters down through even to a local neighborhood communities who demand certain things from their local uh, governments. And who benefits from corruption in the old world and in the new uh, world of new institutions? And once these institutions change, does anyone and who have incentives to, um, to adopt new evolutions of those current institutions? Or do they just lead to entrenched uh, rights? So do do the people have actually the means or the tools to affect uh, the change? And in thinking about all the metaphors, the metaphor that I uh, came up with was, was not wheels and uh, uh, grease and sand, but I thought of it as a layer cake. So at the very bottom, you know, there are the communities, the the neighborhoods, the local officials, and they all rely on each other as they uh, get to the top. And then at the very top, you can think about Xi Jinping and his anti-corruption campaigns and how does that filter down into uh, the bottom. In thinking about it this way, I have a couple of other scenarios that uh, would maybe complement the existing work on dynamic change to institutions, which is that um, 
you can think about growth and corruption happening with little bottom-up evolution towards better institutions. And so it's just uh, taking that hypothetical situation of other scenarios. So we know that between 1998 and 2004, there were lots of top-down reform. And these top-down reforms need to be met together with those bottom-up reforms. So how much of the growth was thanks to these top-down reforms like dismantling price controls, dismantling production quotas. You know, you just don't want to shoot yourself in the foot and you will get some growth and institutional improvement out of that. So what was the relative magnitude of bottom-up versus top-down reform? That's one, one thing I wondered about. Another um, question that I had was in, in reading a recent uh, just came out this summer by, by Ang in, in Foreign Affairs. She has an article about the marriage of growth and corruption. And she has this example uh, where it is very relevant to current events. But she has this example of a party secretary uh, from Yangzhou. And she says that it's very common ever since, say, 2012, where uh, these officials have made their money because they are leasing out government land. And they're doing this because of restrictions in local revenues. And in the process, they are uh, getting kickbacks. So this one official, he is building an incredible amount of new um, uh, uh, construction sites in order to raise the economic growth of his local city. And he's turning to corporations to rebuild that land. And all or most of the land contracts were to private construction companies. So not only did he direct these contracts to private companies, but they were owned by his friends and his friends in turn repaid him in the form of kickbacks and a percentage of the company shares when it went public. He did phenomenally well. The city grew and he was promoted to a better job. And so um, in, in this whole story, then um, the government, the top layer of government also gains because overall economic growth is increased. But as time goes on, they get increasingly concerned about uh, stability. And so those are very complicated questions to uh, to resolve. And how that all plays out is a little bit unclear. So this is a, a plot, a figure from um, the, the earlier paper by Bai Xian Song. And what it shows is that this is a 2015 figure of an insurance company. This insurance company has 39 owners two of which are state-owned firms, which are the white circles, 37 of which are holding shells, and those are the gray circles. And every holding shell is in turn all owned by other holding shells. And what this makes clear is that it's really hard uh, to see who's owning what because they are working really hard. These individuals are working really hard to hide their ownership behind a series of holding companies. And they are doing this in order to um, to hide their political their political connections, which is what's coming out here. Um, I'm going to leave the uh, my last slide to just say an anecdote from the 18th century, which is what I know most about. And this is a anecdote of a bottom up bureaucratic innovation in a economy in which there is no technological change. And so um, this is a story about how do we separate bottom-up bureaucratic innovations that lead to growth and just bottom-up bureaucratic innovations that are born out of desperation and lack of funds and do not result in economic growth. And so this is a uh, story where they had uh, they had froze the land tax. And so local officials were strapped for, for revenues. And what they did were a couple of things. They falsified 
what they owed to the higher up governments. That's one thing. But in addition, they started an informal practice of just charging illegal extra surcharges on top of the existing quota taxes, which they call meltage fees. These were uh, in order to account for waste from melting down the silver. And that started at a local level and eventually this was actually legalized. And so it was no longer a corrupt practice. But uh, the way that that spread was that the emperor watched carefully reports of the initial reaction at a particular province before allowing it to spread to other provinces. I thought about this example when I was reading the household responsibility system and how similar that process was. Uh, but what was the emperor watching for? Probably whether this resulted in rioting, probably whether it resulted in instability around the province and not not whether this was a uh, efficient tax, whether uh, this was beneficial to economic growth. This seemed to be an innovation that local officials came up with by the seat of their pants and eventually became official policy. And once it does, nobody has much incentive to change it after that because they were getting revenues from it. So uh, that's uh, the, my last slide here. And again, I wanted to say these are very important questions that um, I hope many more people think about and, and work on because this is a dynamic evolution of institutions which seem awfully important to economic growth. That's thank, all. Thank you very much, Carol. And uh, so if you could stop your share, uh, I, we, we're really, uh, I guess, pretty much out of time. Are there any pressing questions though, either from the online participants or those of the, uh, in the room, I mean, we've, this uh, is a trio of really fascinating papers and for someone not familiar with this literature, a real education for me. Uh, David, do you wanna just, yeah, please, if you could use the mic, I think, I, I think it's attached over than everything else. Just on the, uh, the last paper, I found all three very interesting, but I was, my reference point is I've been very taken with Isabel, Isabel Weber's recent book on how China escaped shock therapy. And I'm wondering about sort of shock therapy as a default position on one side and how what you're describing would be one way that sort of, of, of China avoiding shock therapy, sort of that element of this sort of, sort of corruption as, as an issue of the, you know, the changing wheel sort of thing. So I'm just wondering about shock therapy as sort of a, a reference point, which may well involve plenty of its own um, but are you familiar with Isabel Weber's book? I'm just wanting your take on that. Are you, are you can you? I cannot hear very well. I don't. Could you go? Okay, to why don't you just you can you can do this mic here? Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Basically, I was wondering if you're familiar with Isabella Weber's recent book on how China escaped shock therapy. And this was a big issue in the 1980s, 1990s, where shock therapy was considered as really a, a serious sort of major alternative to what it was doing, the, the gradual thing. And um, so I'm wondering, sort of incorporating a, a shock therapy alternative as sort of one of the things, um, as, as sort of one of the um, positions that one of your, you know, extreme side, I guess, sort of on the extreme right. And, and, um, and what you're doing, the corruption is sort of sanding the wheels as one way of sort of avoiding that or sort of that, that sort of pull. Do, do you understand what I'm trying to yeah. say? Yeah, I mean, I, I haven't read the book on Weber, but it's true that China followed a gradual approach as opposed to the shock therapy that if if I'm not wrong, it was also suggested for Russia after the when when the wall fell, and actually I think that co corruption could be a way actually to what do you say to fill the like a void, and it's true that also probably there was a permissive a more permissive environment in China at the time because probably under the Mao regime corrupt practices would have been even might have been stopped in a more um, even bloody way, I would say. But yeah, I mean, I don't know if I understood fine your question. You mean that whether you see corruption as a way to fill in the void, right? Or void, but I'm also thinking in terms of your framework where you have these two poles um, 
these sort of two extremes. Uh, um, I can't remember what they were. There was there was the one uh, close and open institutional systems. I, and, and open is sort of the, the shock therapy alternative, and then closed is sort of the other extreme. And then what you're saying. So I'm I'm, I'm saying shock therapy is one way of defining what you're 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 putting up as the open. That that's kind of my su suggestion. Oh, okay, but the shock therapy would mean more to the way and the speed of reform, right? Meaning. What I Russia know. got was a shock therapy because they, I mean, they tried to turn all their institution suddenly, very fast, uh, formally into into. Right. And I think the issue is they didn't really have. There was really no clear institutional default there. I mean, that, that's part of the problem. But anyway. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody. For those who have stayed through to the end, and we appreciate your participation.